it's a pleasure to see a full classroom. My uh, last two classes are very sparsely attended. Uh, uh, I'm not mad, it was uh, the circumstances, uh, but I appreciate the brave and the few who actually came here on a Friday and even worse on a Sunday uh, to, uh, to learn. Um, a number of you have emailed me to say that you watched the lectures. Most of you haven't. You should. Um, I think I said last week you have a week to watch them, and if you email me to verify, I'll mark you present. Otherwise, it's an absence. Uh, I think that's fair. Um, more importantly, your midterm is in a week from today. So, absolutely, you should be ready for that. Uh, any questions before we get started? Anything in your minds? Why are you all so cold? I don't understand. Is it cold here? Yeah. You're feeling great. No, that, no, that, 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 that didn't look right. Okay. Uh, I, I forget sometimes I'm, I'm on the internet. Uh, so context matters. Um, anyway, hopefully if you're cold, as Jimmy Carter said, bring a sweater. Speaking of Jimmy Carter, let's talk about Nixon. Um, <laughs> what a transition. Yeah, what a transition, huh? Well... Jimmy Carter became president in large measure because of Gerald Ford's pardon of Richard Nixon. Oh, what a good is a good segue. Indeed, after Nixon resigned, we've got all these Supreme Court cases, President Ford, who was a speaker, became the vice president, and then became the president. President Ford gave Richard Nixon a full and complete pardon, not just for all uh, past acts, but any future indictments. And it was considered a very controversial effort that a president could pardon another president. Um, Jerry Ford, until the day he died, defended his pardon of Nixon. And one of the reasons why he pardoned him, he said that the act of accepting the pardon meant that Nixon accepted guilt. Probably not true. The Supreme Court suggested that in the case of the early 20th century. But many Americans resented Ford for giving Nixon a pardon. And that is probably probably, not solely, but in large measure why um, Carter won the election in 76. I told you it's a transition. But going back to Nixon, I want to start with a question, and it, it was invoked in the, um, in the in Nixon v. Fitzgerald. There's so many Nixon cases today, right? There are two. There's U.S. v. Nixon, Nixon v. Fitzgerald. Um, and, and there's not really a right or wrong answer to this. I want to gauge exactly as it's stated, true or false. The president is above the law. True or false, that's your question. Okay. There's not a right or wrong answer, but I'm gonna probe you on why you think what you think. I have an example here. I don't know what this is. I noted why this is on the screen on this side so you can see everything. It's easier than calling XT. <laughs> Send me an email with your name and your date, okay? That's fine. <coughs> A few more seconds. All right. And I'll stop it here. Okay. Where did I leave off with you last week? Carlo, my friend. What did you put? I put false. Okay. I could see why. I mean, it's well, to, uh, talk it out. Give, give me, give me your question. thought process. Let me hear what you think. Kind of a trick question. A trick? Would I ask you a trick question? Mm -hmm. what, kind of, what kind of statement is that? My God, you trust me by now. Well, well don't. I think really should. The answer is a little tricky. Um, the, uh, I mean, true because the president is the executive, and so he's in control of, uh, the, you know, everything criminal. Oh. But he is not above it in the sense that uh, he can get away or in this case uh, claim a general executive uh, privilege of immunity. Carla, let me ask you a follow-up question. What's the law? In general or? I put a statement up there. Presence above the law. You give an answer. See, that's why What's the it's law? kind of a tricky Help question me. because if you're talking about the laws of this country, I guess you're going back then to the Constitution. He's not above the Constitution. But 
but he must follow it, and he's the Does enforcer. the Constitution give the president certain powers that no one else in the country has? Yeah. 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 Kevin, what, what do you think? I agree with uh, Carlo that it is false, but um, reading Justice Wright's uh, dissent really sheds a light on... That's a sentence to Nixon Fitzgerald, right? Yes, it is. Uh, really sheds a light on how he views it that with the civil plane, the president is immune to it, which kind of makes him, on the face of it, above the law. But I don't think... Well, in that case, weren't judges also immune to certain litigation? And we're, we're in a... David, you're nodding. Prosecutors immune to certain litigation. What, what, what do you think about this? Well, that's, I mean, it says what they say. Yeah, certain judicial officers and hiring officials are immune as well. But I just thought with the, kind of like some of the arguments, I guess, saying the president was above the law was, you know, we don't need the president dealing with harassing uh, all these extra litigations in his soul. <laughs> He's a busy guy, right? Yeah, he's a busy person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what, what do you think? True or false? What do you, what do you put here? Uh, I'll put false because I guess, yeah, I, they are, the, US, the president does have some immunity as a mm -hmm. executive. Yeah. But that doesn't mean there's not remedies to such an impeachment if he does not. How oh, impeachment? Does that. Now, is impeachment within the law, above the law? Where does impeachment fall? In other words, if, if it takes an impeachment trial to get rid of him, did he actually break the law? They won't put true. Anyone? Yes, uh, go for it. Um, yeah, he's above the law. You can, I can see by the argument I'm saying is, I mean, he could, he could say, as you're saying, he could, he should have been. Should it be like in fear of being sued for making decisions? So Zach, what powers does the president have that put him above the law in one one respect? Does it want to read your question today? myself a little bit? <clears throat> um, I don't know. Want to read it today? Yeah, case. Is, is it that he hired and fired people that are investigating? Yeah, he has power to fire people who are investigating him. That's pretty significant, right? What else? What other powers do we have? Adam, what other powers does the president have? That are so unique that no one else has. It's a very important power. Veto power? Well, there's a veto power for legislation. I'm talking personal conduct. What power does he have that no one else in the country has? Uh, he's not. What? Uh, no. Okay, talking about the text of the Constitution here. No? Pardon. Pardon. I don't know who said it. Whoever said it first, you're right. You're both in the same line, so it's fine. Pardon power. That's a pretty awesome power, right? Someone was charged with a crime, convicted before a judge and jury. His sentence was upheld by the Court of Appeals. Sentence upheld by the Supreme Court. Right? All arms of our government were involved in that. The laws were passed by Congress. Executive branch prosecuted them. Judicial branch upheld the, the conviction. Jury, the people, right? The, the people themselves were involved with the conviction. And at the last minute, the president comes and says, no, never mind. You can go home now. We're going to wipe away your conviction, wipe away your sentence. That's a pretty, pretty awesome power. I mean, it, it's, it's given to the president without many restrictions at all. I mean, he can't pardon impeachments, he can't pardon state crimes. That's about it, right? So again, who else put true for this this, uh, this question? Anyone else want to raise their hand? Yeah, Case, go for it. I, I put true because I, I read the like the transcript of Nixon. And, oh, you read it, good for you. And Halderman, and I'm, or Halderman. Yeah, exactly. And I'm pretty sure that like, goes on. The, the, the only difference with this is it was recorded, recorded and they have proof of it. But I know that the president, all presidents, influence you know what's what gets investigated and what gets followed in one way or another. So does that make him above the law in your mind? Well, he shouldn't be above the law, but he can influence if he is or is not above the law. Okay, fair. Anyone else want to put in for true? Yeah, yeah, Aaron. Uh, yeah, I put it as true just because of uh, on reading the supply dissent. That was a five-four case, by the way. Pardon? That was a 5-4 decision. 
My four was not, I was not a, could have gone the other way just as easily. I mean, I want you to keep this in mind, just because the case was five, four, one way doesn't look right. You're allowed to criticize five, four, you criticize a nine, zero, I don't care. But the, just because something, just because five lawyer Supreme Court says it doesn't mean it's right. I don't want you to ever forget that. It's, don't take what they say as gospel, it's not. But, but, but given Justice White's dissent, why, why do you think it's true? Uh, just because you know, he's, uh, he's immune from personal litigation. Right. Uh, and, uh, I guess that's one way that he's above the law. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, go for Kelsey. Um, I was thinking to the um, Trump read and how it talked about we have to wait for certain things so the president's out of office, right. which implies that you're above the law in some way. You have to wait. Okay. Uh, yeah, last one, Andre. Well, it just seems kind of like maybe the the person is not above the law, but the office. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. What's the difference here? Are you saying there's a there's a person separate from the president? I that's one person to me. Well, who's taking the oath? He's only like Obama's not president anymore. It's it's an office, so you only occupy it as president while you're in. Well, the question is not is Donald Trump above the law, the question is the president above the law. So while someone occupies that office, is he above the law? Is he above the law? Amber, shake your head no. I just don't think so. You can still be uh, charged with certain things that... Can, can you be charged? How can the president be charged? Isn't that the entire point of this lecture? All right, let, let's move on. I, I, your comments are good, but I, I want to I hit another point. The statement that Justice White put in his assent has gotten a lot of attention. I think it resonated with a number of you when you're reading White's dissent. It's a very well written dissent. But what does it mean to be above the law? Right? I think that phrase presumes that the law applies to everyone equally. But that begs the question does the law apply to the president equally? Or does that one person have special privileges that no one else has? Do other members of the government have special privileges that are unique? So we already mentioned judges, right? If a judge issues a bad ruling, you can't sue him over it. Right? If a prosecutor does something bad, it's almost impossible to sue the prosecutor. Why do we make judges and prosecutors immune? It'll be very hard to have a legal system if the judges are hauled into court whenever they have a bad decision. They can be reversed by an appellate court, right? There's a process to get rid of their judgments, but you can't can't sue a judge. Um, now, if a judge, for example, is an employer, and then the judge discriminates against an employee because of their race or religion or whatever, right? You can sue him in this context of as an employer, but not for his duty as a judge when his robe's on. Congress, too. There's a provision in the Constitution called the Speech or Debate Clause, which basically says members of Congress can't be prosecuted for what they say on the floor of the House or the Senate. It's a specific guardian above and beyond the First Amendment, that members of Congress can't be held accountable for what they say on the floor, that they have that freedom. I can be charged for what I say in the street if I engage in you know, hate, uh, you know, some sort of defamation or if I engage in um, uh, some sort of incitement to violence, but on the floor of this House or Senate, they can't. Even the president. We discussed last class with five people who were here um, that the president, right, the president can fire people. Okay? The president can fire people working underneath him. The president can fire prosecutors who are investigating him. The president can fire a lot of people who are getting in his way. The president has a pardon power. He can pardon people who are being investigated. Perhaps as a method to frustrate that investigation. Maybe he can even pardon himself. It's a real question. Um, that uh, I don't know, maybe we'll have to decide, maybe not. I don't know. But the entire question of whether the president above the law simply begs the question of what laws are the president subject to. And if the president is immune from certain laws that are applicable to us plain folk, or simple people, that he's not acting illegally. 
Or is it like Case said, the Nixon exchange? I am the president, so it's legal, right? Does the mere fact that the president does it make it lawful? Congress disapproves, they can intervene with an impeachment proceeding. But if the president acts and Congress says nothing, where do the courts fit in, right? How are the courts supposed to figure out the answer? You should have noticed that in reading these opinions, there's not much precedent to go on. There really isn't. The opinions are weak as they are weak. There's, 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 they're, they're basically making it up. I, I, don't, I, I don't have a nice way of putting it. There's not much law there. It's like Fitzgerald. I think Justice White makes his point. He's like, look, this is not anything that's written in stone. You're basically going on what you think is the best separation of powers. So that's basically the question, right? How do courts understand our separation of powers when the president is being sued in court? And this comes up in three contexts for our class today. I apologize, I didn't make a blog post for your pictures. I, it totally slipped my mind, I'm really sorry. Uh, I've not taught this class before, I'm sure as you're all aware, because you can find lectures from last year. Uh, I added it because of the circumstances of our present, so it would be useful for you. Um, but the three cases today illustrate the president's um, interaction with the courts in three contexts. So first, U.S. v. Nixon, is can the president be compelled to disclose materials for criminal investigation? Not of him, right? That's the important point. It wasn't just because Nixon was involved. It was actually for the benefit of other people. Um, the second case, Nixon v. Fitzgerald, discusses can the president be sued for conduct, official conduct, during his presidency? Um, that it happened afterward was a happy coincidence, right? But the question is, can you be sued for official act during your presidency? And the last case, Clinton v. Jones, which some of you may recall, um, uh, considered whether the president could be sued during his administration for acts that came prior to the administration. Um, you should note that there's one question missing here. Can the president be charged with a crime during his presidency? Um, most people agree that the president can be charged with a crime after his term ends. There's not much disagreement on that. But the question of whether the president can be charged during his administration with a crime, it's a big question. Another question not addressed here, can a president be prosecuted in a state court rather than a federal court? Why is that relevant? Because in the federal court, the federal government brings up the prosecutions, and the president is, is supervising those prosecutors. Not in a state court. In a state court, a state attorney general could bring an indictment against the president. And would the supremacy clause bar that? I think that's a tough question. I think of, I think of McCullough v. Maryland. And Maryland tried to put a tax in the Bank of the United States to put it out of business. And one of Chief Justice Marshall's rulings was that a state cannot destroy a federal institution. That's not a clear rule, but from my, from my vantage point, I think that prohibits the state attorney general from charging the president, but that would have to be litigated in state court. And not until it gets to the US Supreme Court would we actually get a federal judge ruling on this issue. Yes, sir. Wouldn't that case just pretty much every time be removed to federal court, though? Can you remove criminal cases if it's brought under state law? I don't think you can. Right, you basically charge the, the suit would be the president violated some state corruption law. There's no federal question. There's no diversity in criminal. It stays in federal court. Any other questions? Let's move on to the first case. All right, U.S. v. Nixon. Now, I already discussed at some painfully long length the sequence of events that gave rise to Morris v. Olson. I will briefly <coughs> summarize it as relevant to this case. So, um, 
the Nixon administration was involved with a break-in at the Watergate Hotel. It doesn't seem that Nixon knew about it when the break-in happened, but he sure found out about it later. And these guys, they were called the, the plumbers, were, uh, were, were arrested for breaking into this hotel, which was the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee. Um, Nixon was aware of, or at least signed off on, paying off the, the burglars, paying them off. But I'm sorry, they weren't the, they weren't the plumbers. The plumbers were someone else. The plumbers were the people who made the thing go away, but they, they paid off the, uh, the burglars. Um, and Nixon was on tape confirming that he knew about the decision to pay off these burglars. Um, there was a special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, and he demanded that Nixon turn over the recordings from the Oval Office. And he asked the district court to issue what's called a subpoena. A subpoena ducis tecum is a word that you may never see again. Subpoena ducis tecum, um, which is basically a request for some sort of document. So the special counsel, special prosecutor asked the district court to issue the subpoena ducis tecum for these records. Okay. Um, Nixon, instead of giving what was asked for, provided transcripts of the conversations, but they were edited, right? Mm -hmm. So he didn't hand over the tapes, he handed, handed over an edited transcript, and there's some segments that were missing, they were redacted, okay? At that point, the president's lawyer moved to quash the subpoena. Okay. What does quash mean? Dismiss. It's a funny word. Um, but quash, like squash, right? But it's not squash, it's quash. Nixon's lawyer moved to quash the subpoena. And he moved to quash the subpoena. I like that word. He moved to quash the subpoena on the grounds that the president had a privilege not to be required to deliver these records to the court. Okay? Now, the long and short of it is the Supreme Court, as you know, ruled 9 0, actually, 8 0, rankers who didn't participate. The court ruled 8 0 in favor of the, uh, or against President Nixon. The court ruled 8 0 against Nixon. And eventually, shortly thereafter, Nixon turned over the tapes and resigned very shortly thereafter. Um, so the Supreme Court's decision here um, did enforce Nixon's resignation. He was probably going to be removed from office eventually. But it accelerated, brought closer Nixon's ending of his term. Um, precisely because at this point, he had to give up the goods, and he had implicated himself in the recording of a, uh, uh, he implicated himself in the recording saying he knew about the, uh, the burglary and he wanted to um, pay off the, the, the burglars. So any questions on that so far? Um, the first part of the case I don't want you to focus too much on. It's what's called justiciability. Um, I don't teach it in this class because we don't have enough time. But you learn basically in civil procedure that federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction, right? State courts have general jurisdiction, they can hear any case they want. <coughs> Federal courts have specific or limited jurisdiction. They can only hear what are called cases or controversies. They can't issue advisory opinions. So there was some question about whether the courts would even consider uh, a dispute within the executive branch. What do I mean by that? The case is called United States versus Nixon, but it wasn't really U.S. v. Nixon. It was special prosecutor versus Nixon, right? That, that, that was really the party in interest. The special prosecutor worked in the executive branch for the president. And there was a legitimate question of whether the court could resolve a dispute between the president and his subordinate, right? Usually a dispute between the president and his subordinate is resolved in-house, right, within the executive branch. But the court here said, and maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, I don't know. You want to disagree with the 5-4, I'll, I'll do it through the unanimous decision. I think it's probably wrong. But that the president and the special prosecutor can litigate this claim in court, right? So that's that's the first part. I don't want you to focus too much on justicia, that word I can never say, justiciability. But the more important question is one of executive privilege. Who am I up to? I think Brandon, you're next. Brandon, 
Is there some sort of clause in the Constitution that asserts the president has privileges or a privilege clause of some sort? Not that I recall. You're right, there, there's none, right? There's no clause in the Constitution that says the president can resist a subpoena. So where do the courts get this idea from? Where does the court get this notion of executive privilege from? It's nowhere in the Constitution. It doesn't say a word about it. Had, where, where does Justice Berger, Chief Justice Berger get this idea from? That he's, he's the one running, running the country. Well, that's true, but why does he need a privilege from subpoenas from courts? Why do his comp, uh, why do the president's communications need to stay confidential? Forgetting that whether it's an absolute privilege, what, what's the argument in favor of having any privilege? Well, the, the, the reasoning for the, the valid uh, need for protection of communications, uh, he says, human experience teaches that those who expect public dissemination of their remarks may well temper and or. In your own words, what's that mean? Um, that means they might not, <clears throat> they might not be, they might temper temper their approach to difficult uh, decisions they need to make. Give me an example. And, and, I mean, I could imagine brainstorming going on in a war room and, you know, the president wanting, you know, all, all kinds of scenarios and things that we could do, hypotheticals. And if his advisors knew that that stuff could be disseminated, they might they might temper Good. or restrain themselves from yeah. throwing so, out an opinion that they, they think might be scoffed at. Or, Very good. So in the same sense that I have this camera here, I know that everything I say we put on the internet. In general, in general, I assume everything I say will be on the internet. I, one of you may have a recording. One of you may have a, you know, an iPhone recording. I just assume everything I say will be recorded. That's why I have my own recording to back up, so you can't edit yours. It's actually, <laughs> you think this is for your benefit. It's actually probably for mine. Uh, 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 I can never be accused of saying something because it's recorded. Like, I've had students accuse me of stuff. I'm like, okay, show me the tape, and I can actually say it. Right? Students have very bad memories of what was said, especially when they're offended. Um, uh, so, <laughs> it's true. So this is my own insurance policy, but it's for your benefit as well, but it's really for my own insurance policy. But the point is this, right? If I'm doing something not like a public class, if I'm advising the president on a national security matter about you know whether to invade a country, um, if I know that my advice can be put out in a you know record, I might not be so willing to be candid. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, the president's papers generally are released years after the administration concludes. In fact, President Clinton. Um, a bunch of his last papers were only released like a year or two ago, you know, over a decade after his administration ended. Why? It's not to protect the president. The president, whatever, he doesn't care. It's to protect the people giving him advice. Right? The low level, I don't mean to be a low level attorney with that person, but you know, the, 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 you know the, the, the associate who gave advice to the president has a career ahead of him. And what if he gave some advice that wasn't too good? And in hindsight, it looks really bad. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, on, on the U.S. Supreme Court, um, uh, the justices have a very s scattered position with respect to their papers. So, for example, when Justice Marshall passed away, he made all of his papers available immediately, including papers on pending cases not yet decided, which was an absolute disaster. Uh, other justices take the approach that says, I will release the papers uh, as justices pass away. So, for example, Justice Rehnquist uh, 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 said that uh, he would release all the papers until the next justice was alive. So let's say Justice Rehnquist was appointed in, what, 72. Um, justice Stevens was appointed then in 76. Or no, 70, yeah, 76. Between 72 and 76, there's no the living justices. So those papers are available. But while Justice Stevens is alive, those papers are sealed. When Justice Stevens passes, but not for a long time, <coughs> Rehnquist will then release more of his papers from his estate. Justice Souter, though, did the crazy thing. Souter said, I will release my papers 50 years after my death. He's in his 70s. 
So really, that means another, I don't know, 60 or 70 years from now. Um, I made a pact with a friend, we'll both be in our hundreds by that point. We'll go to the uh, Supreme Court, uh, we'll go to the Library of Congress and read Souter's papers. Um, but generally, you protect your sources, you protect your law firms. So there's one reason for the privilege is that you don't have your subordinates um, hesitate for giving you honest advice, right? And what's another reason why you'd want a privilege for the president beyond protecting, you know, associate lawyers and young, young advisors? Well, you don't want him to be able to sue all the time. Well, but why, why would the, but this, this is not a suit, this, but you be careful. That you're right for the next case, That's right. but it's a similar idea. Privilege from, from, from producing documents, right? Why, give me another reason why we have an executive privilege for producing documents. Well, some things are extremely important to the national so? security. How so? Well, I mean, some things that the president talks about, not everyone should know because then people that were going up against him war. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're all aware of something called the Freedom of Information Act, right? FOIA. Let's see, you've seen the acronym like this. It's FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. And it generally says that you can request certain documents from the government. But there are exceptions for documents involving national security, diplomatic missions, and the like. Because um, frankly, we don't need to know everything that's going on. It sounds really bad. But <clears throat> the essence of classified information is that if people know about it, it's not classified anymore. And if there are certain secrets that should not be disclosed, there's a good reason why. Um, perhaps people are planning terrorist attacks, and if that information is released in advance, the investigation blows up. You always have this when newspaper reporters break stories, like, oh, this, this, this terrorist cell has been planning an investigation. Okay, you just blew a four-year investigation. Good job. I'm not saying it's wrong, but the reporters got it through a leak or whatever. But the different question is whether the government can resist a subpoena by providing these documents. But I think, I think you, you settled on two of the main reasons, right? Two of the main reasons why we have a privilege. You want to shield employees, and you want to also protect national security from leaking important stuff. Okay. So I think everyone more or less agrees that you should have a privilege, but that's not the end of the claim. What Nixon asserts here is not just a privilege, but an absolute privilege. An absolute privilege. Dave, what, what, what does this mean, absolute privilege? Basically, our question across the board. So that means Nixon can say no to any request whatsoever. Okay. And David, what does the court do with um, this, this claim of an absolute privilege? They pretty much dismiss the idea of it. Very good. Very good. The court rejects the notion of an absolute privilege, okay? And they say this. Absent a claim of the need to protect military, diplomatic, or sensitive national security interests, we reject this claim of absolute privilege. Now, the reason why they reject it is a little bit hard to pin down, and I want to maybe tease this out a bit. Aaron, what are at least one of the reasons why the justices mm -hmm. believe that the court must reject an absolute privilege in this case? Uh, I think it was uh, Amendment 4. What's Amendment 4? Uh, the requirement of a speedy and fair trial. Yeah, okay. I think it's five. Yeah, okay. It's not the fourth amendment, I think it's the fifth, but yeah. Uh, I think they also said five for the uh, early defense to face their accusers. I, I, I don't really understand that one. Okay, let me explain. It, 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 so, so the Fifth Amendment is a due process clause. The Sixth Amendment is the compulsory process. Let me explain this generally. In the background of this case were criminal prosecutions against the people involved in Watergate. Again, Nixon was not charged as a defendant. He was charged as, oh, here, I love this one, as an unindicted co-conspirator. If you ever watched Law and Order, you know what this is. People know what I'm talking about? An unindicted co-conspirator. Someone said, uh-huh, please tell me what this means. What is an unindicted co-conspirator? Yeah. They know, he's, they know he's guilty. He's in the grand jury documents. They discuss him, but they're not going to indict him or bring him up on charges. Later. Basically, so the way our, in our criminal justice system, no, no, no. So in our, 
I didn't know anything about the law until I watched Law and Order. I think I learned more from that than any prim law. Um, let's be serious. Um, not, not my favorite class. But I know the Fifth Amendment. Um, the, way our, the way our system works is before the federal government can bring up for trial, it actually submits before a grand jury. What's a grand jury? Well, grand means what? Big, right? Big jury. And the purpose of a grand jury is to have a group of people, maybe 10, 20 people, whatever it happens to be, who say, is there enough evidence to go to a, go to a, go, go forward, right? It's a very low standard. And basically everyone can get into that. It's not very hard, okay? In this case, there was an indictment against all the people involved in Watergate. Nixon was not indicted, but he was basically listed in the documents as a conspirator in the Watergate conspiracy. Right? So they didn't think to charge him with a crime, but they did implicate him in the, in the underlying offenses. So why don't you think of it this way? Forget about Nixon for a minute. Right? Forget about Nixon. You're one of the defendants in this, in this case. Right? You have to put on your own defense. Boone, what evidence do you want to put on if you're, you're on the defense in this case? What do, you want to, what do you want to put into the record on this case? Um, What's like the big thing that's probably going to help you out a lot? If, you, if you're one of the people involved in this burglary, what do you really want in it? That the president told me to do it? Yeah, right? You want the president, in his own words, saying, yeah, you go do this and I'll pay you off for it. Go, go, go give some money, right? Now, it doesn't make you innocent, right? But it probably mitigates, like, look, I thought it was okay, the president told me to do it, right? That probably won't get you off. Of, of your jail sentence, but it made things a little better for you. So don't think of U.S. v. Nixon as a case about Nixon. Think of it as the criminal defendants, their rights to a fair trial, right? As a criminal defendant under the Sixth Amendment, you have the right of compulsory process. What does that mean? You have the right to bring witnesses against you. You have the right to confront your accuser. You have the right to get evidence in your defense. So what the court was doing here was ensuring the criminal defendants had the evidence in trial that they needed to make their case. Because really what Nixon was saying here is, screw you guys, right? You'll work for me, you follow my orders, but I'm not gonna produce evidence that can mitigate your sentence. I'm not gonna produce evidence that can help you out in court. So even though, again, this case is called USP Nixon, it was primarily about the criminal defendant's rights to retrieve that evidence. Weird, right? Not what you thought when you first read this case. But that's what's in the background. That's why they mentioned the Fifth and the Sixth Amendment, that the defendants have a due process right, right? And the defendants have a, a right of compulsory process under the Sixth Amendment. So therefore, had they ruled, imagine the court went the other way, they ruled for uh, Nixon. These criminal defendants would have been out of luck. They would have had no case. A key piece of evidence in their su support would have just been secret. And we all know it existed, right? There's no mystery. We, we know this happened in hindsight. So it could have actually made a difference. So everyone, everyone get the interplay of the, how the criminal, uh, the criminal procedure amendments play in here. So the court, when they're saying we must weigh the importance of privilege against the fair, administration, the fair administration of criminal justice, what they're talking about is these guys deserve a fair trial, right? The seven of them, or six of them, or however many there were. These six or seven guys deserve a fair trial. And the president holding back this evidence prevents them from getting a fair trial. All right. So questions on the first case. Questions on the first case. Yeah. So I I kind of interpret it like a balance of separation of powers, also, because uh -huh. I think part of the court's explanation was saying that if he had allowed absolute unqualified presidential privilege, it would have um, impeded on the judicial branch, branch's duty under Article 3. Duty to do what? To execute. Ah, uh, <laughs> criminal. Okay. That, that's the hook, right? The Article 3, the judiciary has a duty to ensure criminal justice and give defendants a fair trial. Right? The court's power to subpoena is um, connected with the right of the defendants to have a fair trial. So this case, although it's about executive power, really centers on the criminal defendant's rights. 
although that was ancillary, right? No one really cared about these seven guys at all. They wanted the tape to take down Nixon. That's what this was about. The fact that they used this criminal procedure to, to turn the screws and get the, uh, get the tapes was fine. It was within the correct process. I think they were acting lawfully. But the court holds here nine, or sorry, eight zero, that the president can assert privilege to block or quash that subpoena. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. By the way, I forgot to do the results before. I guess only four of you are, are jaded like me, um, but the rest of you, I guess, are not. Uh, yeah, Ashley. What, um, so it says that Justice Rehnquist took no part. Was there a specific reason? He worked for the Nixon administration. Yeah. He was the head of the Nixon administration's Office of Legal Counsel. He was appointed to the White House from that position. So I think it was entirely appropriate not for him to cast judgment on the administration he worked in. That's the reason why. Yeah. Did Holman go to uh, prison? I think so. You can check on that, but pretty sure he went to jail. Almost all these guys went to jail, um, which is why the pardon of Ford, pardon by Ford of Nixon, was such a big deal. Because there were legitimate concerns that if there were a Democratic <coughs> Attorney General at some point, they could bring Nixon up on conspiracy charges. There, there might be some statute of limitation issues, but you, can, you should get around those. Yeah, Nixon was in a very precarious spot after, after he resigned. I mean, had Nixon not been pardoned, another special prosecutor could have been appointed to try him for crimes. How do you think this would be handled today? Mm -hmm. Well, why do you ask? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I mean, in the era we live in, when we've got Trump talking to Billy Bush about the things those two talked about, and well, thankfully Clinton, that's not an indictable offense. Right, prior to his administration, but uh, certainly uh, Clinton. With well, I'll give you an example, right? I'll give you an example. Um, and I, I try very hard to not make this class a current events class. I know a lot of professors do that. Uh, you don't learn anything that way. But today it's actually relevant, which is why I made the class of this topic. But let's say that, easy example, let's say that years ago when uh, Donald Trump was a businessman, he had pageants in Moscow, right, the Miss, Miss Universe. And let's say his business gave bribes to the Russian government to get hotel contracts there, right? That's pretty standard fare for running business in other countries, right? If you want to run a business in Moscow, you have to pay out bribes. But now he's president. And uh, some attorney general seeks to bring charges against him for Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Nothing to do with the election, right? I'm just saying Miss Universe, Russia, right? As a businessman, not as a president, but as a businessman, he engaged in criminal actions that violated some sort of state, fraud, uh, state criminal law. So Clinton v. Jones is only can the president be sued for prior acts during his administration. My question is different. Can he be prosecuted for crimes during his administration for acts that came beforehand. I and I, I understand that. I guess I guess in the court of public opinion, oh, sure. I don't think that this would be handled today. I mean if, if the if the citizens of this country were able to get past the conversation with Billy Bush, do you think that they would have a hard time getting past this? I have no idea. Uh, and I I'm I'm really not trying to dodge your question. I uh, <laughs> I've been wrong by virtually every prediction I've made in the last couple of years. I've stopped making predictions. Uh, I have no idea. Um, what, I, what, what I will respond to this, though, is that um, the processes that play ahead will be as much about law as about politics. And I try as hard as I can in this class. It doesn't always work. I probably fail to keep it on the law side. Um, in terms of popular opinion and what partisanship does, I, I can't. I couldn't make but I do want you to think about the question of the, uh, the, the criminal indictment for stuff that happened before his administration during that. That thing is a, is a tough question. I don't, I don't have an answer. I've been thinking about this now for months since I wrote this syllabus. I still don't have an answer for you. But everyone get the, the gist with uh, Nixon versus United States, or U.S. v. Nixon, right? That a, dis a federal court can order the president to hand over documents. He has a privilege, but it's qualified, not absolute. Only in cases where there's national security or some sort of you know, diplomatic reason can he assert, uh, 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 can he try to quash the subpoena. Okay? All right, any questions? Let's go to the next case. 
So the next case, Nixon against Fitzgerald, 1982. Um, this is, you know, some years after Nixon left office, right? Uh, we'll think almost eight years after he left office. Um, and this case presents the question of whether the president can be sued for actions that took place during his administration. What makes this case so strange is the case began back in the 70s, but it took forever to actually get up to the court. That's why it's a 1980s case. All right? Uh, who's next? I've lost count. Oh, yeah, Jackson, thank you. Appreciate your candor. Uh, here are the facts generally in uh, Fitzgerald, please. Uh, Fitzgerald was a management analyst for the Air Force. Good. And he basically um, he basically lost his job because he testified about the costs and like, difficulties of some certain uh, planes. And uh, I guess uh, Nixon, or Fitzgerald's supervisor didn't like it, and Nixon ended up pretty much having the job. His job pretty much included the move. Why did he can him? Why do you think he? Why do you think Nixon had enough fired? It, it, what, what, what was the conversation? What was the, the, the reason why? I mean, there was a conversation that went on in the White House. The, the, there was a reason given for why the guy was canned. What do you say, Jude? You're, you're next. Yeah. He had very low marks of loyalty. Oh, yeah, yeah. Loyalty. You hear that, right? He had low marks of loyalty. I think that was a good verbatim quote, too. They used to say fired because he wasn't loyal. Um, so, and so, of course, that's used all the time now. That when you're a civil servant, right, you are in the government regardless of who the given administration is, right? You're not, you're not supposed to be committed to the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, right? You are there as a civil servant throughout. And the reason why the civil service is to insulate it from politics. That's the plan. It's always worked that way. Uh, we have in government political appointees, right? That's someone who, when the president comes to office, the president can put them into office. Some of them have to be confirmed by the Senate. Some of them can just be appointed without. Uh, in fact, I, I had several friends who you know, work in the administration. The inauguration is on January 20th around 10 o'clock a.m., right? And they're actually paid until January 20th at 9.59 a.m., right? Their salary literally terminates at the minute the new president takes the oath because they're not for that president. Mr. Fitzgerald, on the other hand, uh, uh, and I think Jay said it correctly, had no duty of loyalty to, to uh, Nixon. He was simply um, a government employee. And he went out of his way to report and disclose uh, what he saw as malfeasance. There were overruns on bombers, and he testified before Congress, and you know, he, he blew whistles, right? He's a whistleblower, that, that's what the guy did. And so Nixon made some comments, they said this guy has bad loyalty, we gotta let him bleed a bit, whatever, right? Uh, Nixon took responsibility, he said, I'm aware, it's my fault, right? So Nixon actually said, yes, I did this. It's my fault. I'm responsible for this. Uh, the White House press office tried to take retractions, saying, oh, Nixon was confused. He gave me a break, right? It's not, not, not likely. So as a general matter, if, let's say it wasn't the president who said this. Let's say it was like the Secretary of the Air Force, right? And the Secretary of the Air Force gets up there and says, I am firing this guy because he's not loyal. Absolutely, he could sue the Secretary of the Air Force. No questions about that, right? You have civil service laws that protect employees against retaliation, right? If you blow a whistle, you can't be fired for disclosing fraud or whatever else happens to be. Right? But he didn't sue the Secretary of the Air Force. He went after President of the United States. So while the first case, U.S. v. Nixon, considered whether it was an absolute privilege to produce documents, <coughs> this case considers a different type of privilege. Don't confuse them. This case considers an absolute immunity from civil damages. Right? The first case. <coughs> Sorry. The first case was: Is there an absolute privilege from producing documents? Court said no. This case, Fitzgerald, is there an absolute immunity from civil damages? Brittany, what does the court say here? Is there an absolute immunity from civil damages? My understanding is that there's, 
that there is an immunity because, not an absolute immunity, but the president is not above the law. But as long as it's in the capacity of his ah, office. Ah, yes, that's right. Okay. So long as the acts are official, right? So long as the acts are official within the, within the capacity, I like the word you use, within the capacity of the office of the president, there's immunity, right? So I'll give you an easy example, right? The president's walking down the street and he punches someone. Just some guy says something that doesn't like him, the president clocks him in the face. I think you'd be hard pressed to say that the president was acting in its official capacity. Or precisely, those were not his official duties, right? His duty is not to punch people in the face. I think we would all agree on that. Yeah? Now, Nixon, when he made these statements, was what? At a press conference. Is a president giving a press conference with his official duties, Brittany? What do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think you're right. So, because the president delivered these remarks in his official capacity, and it was an official duty, the court says there's immunity from these actions. But even again, if the Secretary of the Air Force had said the same thing at a press conference, he would have been on the hook. But because the President did it, you have an immunity, the court, the majority says by Justice Powell. All right. Um, I, I want to briefly detour to the next case, but the Paul Jones uh, Clinton v. Jones case, right? <clears throat> the allegations that Bill Clinton sexually assaulted her occurred while the president was at a hotel for a conference. And she alleged that that was actually performed in his capacity as governor of Arkansas because he was speaking at the hotel for a conference. Now again, molesting a woman is not the governor's official act, right? But it was done in his capacity as governor because he was there for purposes of business, you know, government business at least. But here, there's no question, Dixon did this in his own official capacity. But then this raises a tough question, right? With a person like the president, whose office consumes the person, the person, the president, the same different, how do we draw a line between what's the president's job and what's not. Isn't everything his job? Doesn't everything he does become liable? What's a, where's our line? What, how, do we, how do we even draw this line? I, I, I don't know the answer. Um, I guess we can look back to his enumerated powers and the Enumerated powers. Does it say anything about punching people in the face? I mean, where, I, mean I, I gave that example. I can make a hundred examples. No, that's not. What <laughs> no, it's not. You have the, you have the right. You have the right to bear arms and not throw arms, right? I, I mean, but what's a, what's what's the answer then? I mean, how do we, how can we conceivably separate the president as a person from the president of the office? I guess you can you can all very subjective language, but if he's working in his official capacity, if he's doing something for the United States, or if he is doing something on behalf of the people and our nation as a whole, I would say he's working in his uh, I'll capacity. give an example. I don't, you know, no one needs to answer, but Twitter, right? <laughs> our t tweets, are, I think, are official statements. Yeah. Um, I, I think they are. But a better question is if the president blocks people on Twitter, <laughs> there's litigation about this right now. Can the president block people on Twitter? Are those tweets within his official acts? Is he subject to immunity under the Fitzgerald case? I, I'm, I, I don't need answers to this. I don't, I don't, it's, it's actually a very difficult First Amendment question. Maybe I'll, when we do the First Amendment, I'll bring it back to it because it's actually a, it's more of a First Amendment question than a, um, than a, than a Nixon Fitzgerald question. The question is, uh, is the president's Twitter a, what's called a, a public forum such that people have access to it? You know, for example, the White House has a fence, and you can't just walk up and knock on the door and say, hi, how are you doing, right? There are limits on accessing the president. So it's actually, I think, a, the question is separate from, from this, but I think to think of it. Raise your hand. No. Sure? No. All right. Fine. I have a question. Um, 
that came to mind as I was reading that, this case. Um, for certain positions, you can go home and not act within that position. But as president, when are you not acting within the scope of your presidency or your delegated That's position? Good. Does the press ever actually have a big meeting? <laughs> exactly. Well, I, well in theory, right? So I think, I think Jay's question is a fair one, right? It's a 24-7 job. I mean, look at how presidents age in their offices, right? Look at their hair color when they start and they finish, right? It's not, it, it's a job that consumes you. It's a job that consumes you for basically every minute of the day. You get briefings any minute. Day. You don't go home. Your house is the White House. You are the, you know, the, the, the leader of the free world, right? So. I think that informs Justice Powell's analysis. Liz, you want to add something? Um, I was just going to say, maybe a more solid demarcation would be him acting as a father. He's not acting as a as father, right? So let's say he, I don't know, he, he neglects his children and he, I don't know, he, he, he has any young, you know, he, 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 he beats a baron too bad, I don't know, whatever, right? <laughs> it, is, it, would that be an act within his official capacity? No. He's done in the White House. I don't know. Yeah, Andre. Um, so could, let's just say this keeps going and Trump gets indicted or whatever for obstruction of justice, could he use this case as a defense? Well, that's for civil. The, the, the issue of obstruction is criminal. Yes. Unresolved question, my friend. That's why I gave it a reading by Professor Colt, who's a friend of mine. Uh, yeah, but Brian Colt, is, he, he, he and I clerked for the same judge, Judge Danny Boggs, <coughs> and Brian wrote a book some years ago about constitutional cliffhangers. All these weird constitutional questions have never been resolved. Like, can the president pardon himself? And can you try the president for a crime? Uh, I read the book years ago. It was a great book, and it's only relevant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. It, it just seems like there are very, very, very like, solid echoes of of this situation in what's going on right now. Now you know why I signed it. Yeah. So yeah, it wasn't relevant like, last year. Now it is. It almost seems like like Trump. Uh, almost relies on this kind of stuff to kind of as like a as like a little shield that he puts around himself where it's almost like when we talk about going above the law where he's almost like a king sometimes, you know, where he's infallible. Everything he does is Well what what I'd say is if the Supreme Court precedent says something then the president can rely on it. It's, I mean when you issue a decision like this, and this is just White's point, it has effects and presidents can rely on it. Um, now, I think this decision, even though it was 5-4, wasn't that surprising because it simply never happened that presidents had been sued before in this context, right? There were a couple of instances, I think, with Truman and Kennedy, but generally in the past, presidents had been sued if somebody couldn't do it. So this is one of the first cases where someone tried to do it, and they were rebuffed. In contrast, with Clinton v. Jones, Jones was allowed to go forward with the lawsuit. And so now, which is why I use the example of the Miss America, the Miss Universe contest before the administration, I think there's a much different argument from the president being indicted for a crime something that happened before the administration than during. I think it's actually a stronger argument that, that the crime before, the one during I think is a lot harder to prove. Right, so, so let's so let me break down Justice Powell's decision for you, right? If you notice again, there's not much law there, there really, there really isn't. And what the court basically says is the Constitution vests the executive power in one person, the president, Article 2, Section 1. The president can fire and remove his subordinates. And thus, there are good reasons why we should ex exempt the president, right? So for one, it's a distraction. I think this is Jay's point a little bit, right? That the president has so many duties and responsibilities. If you divert his energy <coughs> to private lawsuits, it may actually frustrate our effective governance, right? The president has to deal with this stuff. He may not be able to take care of the laws are faithfully executed. He'll be distracted. Right. Um, also, he says that it's really not that bad. There are other checks that can exist. So there's scrutiny by the press. Congress can have oversight. Impeachment. Usually, the president wants to be reelected at least in his first term, so they tend to behave. The president may want to uh, maintain the prestige of the uh, of the executive. And also, presidents are concerned about their legacy. Right. Why did Nixon resign? He knew he was going to get impeached and thrown out of office, there was no doubt. So to avoid being impeached, he stepped aside prematurely. That's, that's significant. I'll give you another one. After the court ruled that Nixon had to turn the tapes over, what if Nixon said, no, make me? 
He sure could have been impeached after that, but he knew he was going down, so he stepped aside preemptively. That's, that's significant, that even the president who had been engaged in this crooked behavior knew that the honorable <coughs> thing to do was be to step aside. Now, again, we've talked about white. Powell responds to this notion of that, the president being above the law, saying it's just rhetoric. Chilling, but wholly unjustified. Right? Why? Because impeachment remains as a remedy to hold the president, the president accountable for his misdeeds. This case is only about a civil jury award. It doesn't involve criminal defendants' rights. And they also note, judges are immune from judgment. Prosecutors are immune from judgment. Congress is immune from various prosecutions. We have lots of actors in our government who are not subject to the usual rules. And as a result, the court says immunity is proper. So any questions in the majority opinion by uh, Justice Powell? Yes. This is kind of sort of related. I guess just talking about immunity. What about like local police officers? I've always wondered why like, police officers would speak. Like how did that? I just always thought about that. Like, do they do they have some kind of local law for that or state law? Like, how does that work? Oh, oh, Isaac's mother, but he's never the APD. I'll be here. Um, I don't think it's a matter of immunity. I think it's a matter of the courtesy not to prosecute members of the police, but they are immune just the same. Uh, anybody from Austin? Remember the, the, the chief of police there? How she got pulled over for DUI? Remember this? Oh, it was the district attorney. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're right, I'm sorry. Not that's chief, it was the district attorney in Travis County. Thank you for reminding me. And she got pulled over, and you can watch the video on YouTube, and she's like, you know who I am? I'm the I'm, I'm the district attorney. I'm going to get you guys fired. She's going on this entire, she's, she's drunk, right? And then and then they put her in the drunk tank, and eventually she sobered up, but she got charged, right? So you shouldn't be above the law. If you're a member of the law enforcement, and you are driving drunk in your own county, she at least spent the night in the drunk tank. I don't remember what happened. She was sentenced, but she, go, just Google the video. You can watch it. Yeah, come on. Going back to your hypo from a minute ago, if uh, Nixon had said no to, to the Supreme Court, what, could he have said, you know, I think he misunderstood the Constitution and, and just kind of held his stand, held his, stuck his gun? What if he did? What if he said, no, not going to do it? Not going to do it, not going to do it. Come in. You know, like with with, with Tawny, S send your marshal to the White House. Have him knock on the door. Let's see what happens. Come, 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 in, come in, Gonzalez, right? Come and take it. Then what? I'm asking you. Here's your question. I'm asking, what happens then? I mean, that that's kind of what I was imagining. It's very like much like the the Tawny situation. It's just, that's just must of the military to stand outside the the White House and say, no, you, you can't get. I, I don't know. Why well, ask? How, how could it have played out? You don't know how to apply for that? Couldn't they just subpoena someone, someone from his staff that would be? The president fired him, so he can't deliver it. Anyone, so anyone who attempts to comply with the president will be moved from office immediately. So what happens if he fires his staff then? If they continue to subpoena everyone from his staff? Okay, you're a president, only one president. The, the Constitution doesn't require staff. Amber? Congress is to impeach him. Congress moves to impeachment. Okay, and what if Congress doesn't? What if Congress says, you know what, we agree with Nixon, he's right about the Constitution. He's right, you can't make him. And then the Constitution, I guess, to make some kind of provision. Oh, you can't even get you can't even get half of the House to vote for a um, impeachment article. How are you gonna amend it? One at one at time, please, one at time. Andrea's the floor. I, I feel like we'll definitely get an answer to this hypo in the next couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are two options. Congress tries to impeach and fails. They don't have no votes. Or they simply say, we're not even going to bring charges. We, we, we think the president's correct. 
always place a shooter on a grassy knoll. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> you know, the Secret Service might be watching this. You're going to get in trouble. So <laughs> that wasn't said. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's a kernel. There's a kernel, right? The entire idea of an impeachment is a coup. It's a legal coup, right? You had an election, and impeachment overturns the outcome of that election. That, that's exactly what impeachment is. And, and don't think of it any other way. I mean, usually when you think of a coup, you think of, you know, generals storming some executive mansion and, and flooding the house with, with, with armed troops. The impeachment process is a coup. Right, the 25th Amendment, which removes a president because he becomes uh, incompetent or whatever else, it's basically a legalized coup. You're, you're overturning the outcome of the election. Based on that, I want to change the answer to my poll question. What did you put? I put that he wasn't illegal because I, I stood it on the fact that he can still go through the process of impeachment and that uh, this doesn't have a problem with civil um, issues. But since impeachment is a coup, well, I, but it's, it's a legal coup. The Constitution allows it. There's nothing wrong with it. It simply spells out less to happen. You have half of the House and two thirds of the Senate to remove the president. Chief Justice presides. But the better question is what the House doesn't. What if the House agrees with Nixon that, that the tape should not be turned over? Now, that didn't happen. At this point, the House was basically going to remove him. There was, there was very there was little doubt as a matter of history. We can look at this with hindsight. But I'm asking, what if the House said. Okay, we agree, Mr. President, or we disagree about whatever. Yeah. What's the answer, guys? What's the answer? Wait for you. Wait, wait till the next election? Yeah. We have short attention spans, right? Yeah. We have an election coming up. The President can't do much by himself, or can he? No, now when they're not in session, I think they do. Well, I'm not talking about appointments, I'm talking about executive power. Is there something you can do unilaterally? So the debate or the discussion we're having here is a very tough one, if you can tell I'm being somewhat elusive. Um, there are no good answers to these questions at all. Um, this is the part of my French when the shit gets real uh, moment, <laughs> right, in the Constitution. Once you get to this point where the court says to the president, the Supreme Court says to the president, deliver these documents, and the president says, make me. Okay. And if the Congress decides not to impeach, they agree with the president. Okay. Don't we have the right to revolution, though? We get that right from, was it? We, we, we Declaration of Independence. All right. The citizens do. I mean, if things are that bad, where Congress is turning against the will of the people and the president refuses Whoa, to sit down. Well, if Congress turns against the will of the people, can't Congress vote every two years and throw people out of Congress? Sure, that's a civil way of doing things. You want you want bulls, <laughs> you, want, you, want, you want blood in the streets. I'm thinking of an election. Man, you guys are eager to have blood in the streets with grassy bulls. God, I don't want you in charge. Uh, Wait two years. Two years is not that long of a time. It feels forever, perhaps. So, so let's go back to a poll, right? Adiyami changed her thing. I don't know. Let me do the poll again. Try it again. Try it again. Go for it. I haven't done this before. Let's try it again. Same question. Same question. True, false. Go for it again. I don't know. She said she, she changed her poll. We'll see what you guys put now.
got. All right, so I'm put E. <laughs> smart, smart Alec. All right, so this was number one. This was number two. Actually, about went to about ten of you change your positions. I went bad. Some of you didn't vote again. I, okay, well, but you know who says debate doesn't change people's minds, right? So there was definitely a shift with at least a plurality of you. Um, our, our republic is only as strong as the people in charge, and as corrupt. As Nixon was, he eventually saw the writing on the wall. And after the Supreme Court's ruling, he indeed turned over the tapes and resigned and avoided the impeachment process where he would have been removed without fail. I mentioned in class last week the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. This was after Reconstruction. And following the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, Andrew Johnson became president. And Johnson tried to fire the Secretary of War, Stanton, who was a Lincoln holdover. Now, the law in effect at the time said the president could not fire the Secretary of, uh, the Secretary of War without Congress's permission. Couldn't do it. Johnson fired him anyway. Stanton basically ordered his, his men that if anyone tries to come here to take me, you arrest them. There was a, a standoff where basically the, the Secretary of War refused to be fired, if you can imagine. He refused to be fired. It's like, if they come here, let them arrest me. He basically holed himself up in, a, in an office if he can't take me. Eventually, I think they, 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 they settled it. But Johnson was impeached for firing the Secretary of War, the removal power. The Senate, the Senate argued that the president did not have the power of removal of the Secretary of War unless Congress gave it to him. Johnson argued, I can fire him whoever I want. That statute is unconstitutional. What was the outcome of that case? One vote. He was saved by one vote. Had one more senator voted, he would have been removed from office. We've had a legitimate coup. You had an assassination of Lincoln, and you came within a single vote of a coup, they were moving the president. Now the irony there is some years later in the case called the Myers versus United States, Chief Justice Taft with majority opinion agreeing with Johnson. Not the majority of the Senate, they agreed with Johnson that the president could fire at will his principal officers. So there the president was almost removed for an interpretation of the Constitution. The Supreme Court rejected later. That's something not fun. But, and I'll leave this note in a little bit of hope perhaps, um, generally, and thankfully in our republic, uh, when we get to the oh shit moment, people tend to behave. Um, it's happened with the Johnson case. It happened in Little Rock, Arkansas. We'll talk about Cooper v. Aaron, right? President Eisenhower sent in federal troops to escort the students to school. It happened with Marbury versus Madison, where Jefferson <laughs> didn't have the opportunity to ignore Jeff, uh, to ignore Chief Justice Marshall. Um, these are all cases where when you get to that breaking point, people tend to not push further and step aside. Uh, but there's no guarantee of anything. Um, let's talk about Berger's concurring opinion in um, Fitzgerald. I, know I'm up to. I think Kelsey, you next. Yeah. Okay. What's what does Berger talk about there? And, and, and give me give me something in Aaron Burr as well. What was the last sentence? Aaron Burr, sir. Let's talk about Chief Justice Berger and the trial of Aaron Burr. <laughs> Do you agree with the main decision that um, private damages um, impede with the president's job? Um, and 
that exposing him to civil damages would open him up for harassment. And, um, what's what's the footnote in Aaron Burr? Let's talk about that for a minute. Is it, am I making this up? There's an Aaron Burr footnote, isn't there? Oh, okay. It the, oh, I'm sorry. It'll be in the third edition, not the second edition. Um, I'm sorry. So, Kelsey, you're off the hook. I, I, I apologize. Uh, I'm actually teaching from the third edition because I'm trying to find typos and stuff, so that's what I'm reading. But there's a new footnote in the third edition, which you don't have, which I will discuss for you now. Um, you all know, and I, I mentioned the, 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 the top student gets the Hamilton ticket, right? I mentioned that. So, um, Alexander Hamilton was a figure of, of uh, immense significance in the American founding and uh, uh, still playing a role in constitutional debates today. <coughs> um, later on in his life, though, Hamilton got into a feud with Aaron Burr, um, who was at the time the Vice President of the United States. Um, and back then, the way that people dealt with their feuds was by the code of the duel. So on the last day of Hamilton's life, they rowed, or rowed in a boat, <coughs> gently down the <coughs> Hudson <coughs> to New Jersey, where <coughs> dueling was committed. Um, they took their cases, and it's was unclear what happened. Hamilton died. They both fired. Uh, unclear if Hamilton was actually aiming or what. Um, but they both fired, and uh, Hamilton died. But that was only the beginning of the middle of Burr's strange life. Aaron Burr was later indicted for treason. He basically tried to mount a coup against the United States. This guy was the vice president. It's insane. And he was subjected to a trial. Who presided at the trial? John Marshall. And Burr requested evidence from Thomas Jefferson, the president. He wanted documents that could exonerate him. Uh, John Marshall uh, admitted that generally you can't proceed against the president as you would an ordinary individual, but he ruled that Jefferson could be subpoenaed. Jefferson cited some but not all the documents, signed the executive privilege. Um, ultimately, because not all the documents were submitted, Marshall had him acquitted, so Burr was not convicted. But the lesson we take there is that even though Jefferson asserted privilege, back back when, in a criminal case, John Marshall said that the privilege was not absolute, and that the president could be subject to the judicial process. Right? But, and here's the big but, he didn't comply all the way. So what we have here is that the judiciary should be hesitant before intruding into the president's decision-making process. Right? Litigation can be used as extortion, Berger says, and will divert the president's attention. All right, Court, let's go on to the dissent by Justice White. We've been talking about that for an hour. What's Justice White's point? <coughs> it says it right there in the first law, uh, for, in the first paragraph. Um, he referenced Madison. Okay. And he said that it stood for the proposition that whether an act is subject to examination depends on the nature of the act and not the identity of who's performing the act. So he said it was they didn't like make a clear line of what conduct from the president would be considered to be like given the meaning of what conduct could have. Okay. Let's go back to our question, Cortland. What does Justice White say about the president being above the law? Back to our first question. What does that mean from the scope of his? Justice White in dissent. What's his point about being above the law? Oh, he says that it's an important part of the framers wanted to avoid the back in the Constitution. Yeah. He, White basically says that the majority makes the president be the king. There's this old maxim, the king can do no wrong, the king cannot be sued. That's the basis for the idea of sovereign immunity, right? That you can't sue the king. And likewise, after the 11th Amendment, or depending how you read Chisholm v. Georgia, at the Constitution's framing, the states were considered sovereign. You could not sue the states without their consent. What the court, or what the dissent by Justice White is saying, is that we're treating the president as if he were king. 
that he cannot be sued for that. The court clothes the office of the presidency with sovereign immunity, placing it beyond the judgment of the law. And in cases like Marbury and in Youngstown, the president was subject to judicial review. Now, those cases are weird citations because Youngstown was against the Secretary of Commerce and Marbury was against the Secretary of State. Um, I, I don't quite know why they're cited. It's a general idea, yes, but the president wasn't part of either of those cases. In fact, it's very strange to sue the president directly. It's not generally done. You don't sue the president, you sue his administration. Um, it's done a lot today, but I think there's problems in those cases for that exact reason. Okay. Justice White also explains that even if there are the possibility of money damages, okay, the president can still be subject to these sorts of rulings. He says, maybe the president's distracted. So what? All government officials might be distracted by litigation. Why is the president different? This is Jay's point. The president's a unique job. The dissent's not persuaded by that. As a result, the dissent says, I reject absolute immunity. And if you notice in the very last sentence, he says, I dissent. Not I respectfully dissent, just I dissent. This is, I describe it as the, the mic drop for the Supreme Court, right? When you want to sign off with it with a, with a, with a <coughs> passion, with a vigor, saying, this is really messed up, you just go, I dissent, you drop it. Um, and this is not done very often. Scalia and Ginsburg did it all the time. Uh, but Justice White tends to be somewhat um, more moderate. This was a, a very passionate case for him. So questions on the Berger, I'm sorry, the, uh, the White dissent. Yeah, Brittany? I just wanted to make a comment. To whom much is given, much is required. Mm. And so, with all of those things being said, with the immunity and everything, I think when you give immunity, or when we're giving any any amount of freedom, mm. sometimes that they could be abused. Mm -hmm. So when you keep in your mind that I've been given this incredible position, mm -hmm. and, and all the people that are riding for me, and all the people that are depending on me to do the right thing <coughs> for Americans in general, and when you go through your job with that kind of mindset, or even beforehand, I mean, when you work your way to presidency, you know at a certain point that you're working your way up there. And in the offices that you're working in, there are standards. You know, in anything, there's standards. And so, with that being in mind, a lot of things you just won't do or won't say, <coughs> even if you want to. It's a lot of things like now that I know the path that I'm going on to be an attorney, that I just try not to say, I may feel it, but even on my Facebook, you know, that's my personal Facebook. You're I'm smart. just a student. You're smart. But to hey, know let, learn from her by the way. <laughs> don't don't do dumb stuff on your Facebook. You're, you're exactly right. But to know that there's a platform and I know where I'm going. And I've been having that mindset since I started school. Because, you know, you never know who's watching you. And so, um, just with that being said, I think when you get those kind of freedoms, you, I mean, any of us can abuse those things. And so with that mindset <coughs> comes with responsibility. So there's a lot of civil cases that won't come about because you already know where you're going. And so I just, I mean, I don't know even where that applies, but that's how I feel about all of this. You know, when you keep in the mindset of what your responsibility is, you'll be more careful. I, I think she said, well, look, listen to her. Don't do dumb stuff on your Facebook. You don't know when they'll come back to haunt you, right? The second you hit submit, post, or send, it's gone. You can never get it back. Like I said, I treat everything I say as if it's on the internet. I mean that sincerely. Um, you have no idea how many emails I write and then delete and never send. The best emails I ever write are the ones I never could send on. Um, don't just don't hit, I, make sure you delete the the the, uh, the, the delete button to the send button. But I, I write lots of letters I never actually mail. Um, but Brittany, your your bigger point I think is even better. Your your sub point was good lesson for your classmates, but your bigger point I think is even better. Um, was it Spider Man with great power comes great responsibility? That that, that answers the gist of your, of your comment. Um, when you take the oath of office, you are um, assuming an office of awesome <coughs> power and uh, uh, immense responsibility, the likes of which no one else can even fathom. Um, and with that, you become transformed, right? You're not just regular public citizen Joe Schmo. You're actually a, uh, an actor in our government, and there's only one of you in the world. Um, so that imposes on you certain obligations. Um, 
Now, the flip side to Brittany's question is, if the president fails to live up to them, you basically have two options. Wait four years for impeachment. Um, and the wait four years plan is not always very palatable to people. And the impeachment is designed to be very difficult. So I'll take it one step back. The decision to elect someone is also a judgment on who they are. Um, if a person behaves a certain way prior to the election, odds are he will continue acting the way after. Maybe not, maybe yes. And if that person isn't de-elected, uh, then, then you're stuck with them. Yeah. I hear what you said, but that was good enough. Um, <laughs> Justice Blackman, and again, no relation, it's M-U-N, um, responds in dissent that the court leaves unasked, unanswered the argument that no one is above the law. Okay. So, but this issue, this is a 5-4 case, uh, I think it's settled enough, but doesn't doesn't resolve the issue permanently. Okay, so any questions on uh, Fitzgerald? Questions on Nixon and Fitzgerald? Yeah, Mark? Did you so when you said like the mic drop moment from White was... Um, I dissent. So the very last paragraph. With the, the ruling here may not leave the nation without sufficient protection against mis misconduct on the part of the chief executive. Such a rule will, however, leave Mr. Fitzgerald without adequate remedy. Yeah. I mean, he, he got hurt here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, Fitzgerald got screwed, right? He got fired. But I'm not entirely sympathetic because Fitzgerald could screw everyone else, right? He could do everyone else in the chain of command. I don't know how much more he could have gotten from Nixon over the other ones. So this, I mean, his request for monetary damages is sure legitimate, but he was <coughs> compensated for the fact that he was fired improperly. So he, he's not a perfect victim, but he did, he did suffer an injury that was not remedied, right? Because the effect of this judgment is on Fitzgerald, yes, you have a valid claim, too bad, right? Now, contrast with U.S. v. Nixon, there was a criminal defendant who has a Fifth Amendment due process right to a fair trial. There, I think, was a much greater interest than for civil damages, which is not of the same constitutional gravity. Does that, that distinction yeah. work for you? Other question that Fitzgerald. Can I have your hand up? No. Okay. Anything else on Fitzgerald? <laughs> I saw, you made a motion. You made a move. A fur, as cops said, you made a, fur, a, fur, a, fur, a furtive motion, as, as police would say. Anything else? All right, to our last case. Okay. All right, the last case, Clinton v. Jones. Um, so I'll give you some background here as well. Um, the, the idea of an executive and scandal may be foreign to you, for those of you who were born uh, after 1996 or so, uh, but for much of the 1990s, the White House was engulfed in scandal. It's, it's not, nothing new. Um, and the, the nature of that scandal concerned Whitewater. What was Whitewater? This was a land speculation deal that Bill and Hillary Clinton had been involved with. Um, exactly what it was, I don't even understand. It was some nebulous land deal, it doesn't even matter. Uh, the important point is that a special prosecutor was appointed, his name was Ken Starr, who was a former federal judge, to investigate the Clinton's land dealings. So the special prosecutor began investigating land dealings, and then before you know it, expanded to Bill Clinton's sexual dalliances, involving uh, Paula Jones, uh, Juanita Broderick, uh, actually Monica Lewinsky, and you know the rest. Um, this case, though, concerned action that took place uh, before Clinton was inaugurated, right? In 1991, when he was the governor of Arkansas, uh, uh, he had an encounter with Paula Jones at a hotel in Little Rock. It's actually now a Marriott. It was called the Excelsior, became the Peabody, you know, with the little ducks, and then became Marriott in 2013. Um, if you notice, they say the facts are taken as alleged. When you're on a motion to dismiss, you basically take the facts and the complaint and you treat them as true. The court was very careful to make that point. Uh, but the allegation is that in a private hotel room at this hotel, the governor uh, made sexual advances at her, and uh, as a result, as a result, she was punished at work. It was retaliation. So she sued him in federal court. She was a citizen of California. He was a citizen of Arkansas. She sued for seventy-five thousand. He got diversity. OK? 
Okay, case goes forward. So what happens? The government advised the district court, um, yeah, nice try, Paul, but we're gonna dismiss this case on privilege, <laughs> right? You can defer all of this until it comes out of office, which at the time would have been another eight years. I think it was filed in, I guess, about seven years at the time. So this goes up to the Supreme Court. Now again, this is not Nixon Fitzgerald. This is not about immunity for the president's actions during his office. This is about whether the president can be sued during his office for prior acts when he was governor of Arkansas. Okay. This case does not also resolve the question of state courts. Can you sue the president in state courts? There's a lawsuit right now in New York State Court brought by a former uh, contestant in the, 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 the Miss Universe or Miss USA pageant who sued uh, Donald Trump for his um, uh, for sexual harassment. Again, it concerned actions before the pageant began and before the administration began. Can you sue the president in state court? Um, the court is, you know, silent about that. They basically say, uh, we don't have to address this now. There's a footnote about the supremacy clause, but uh, I've given this issue a lot of thought. It's, it's not easy. But let's focus on what the court does address. Um, Mark, are you next? Yes. Mark, is there a temporary immunity while the president's in office for acts prior to his administration? Clinton sure thought there was, but the... Oh, Clinton sure, yeah, he thought there was, yeah, but the court held otherwise. Okay, tell me why. Well, I think at the top of 664, we recognize that <coughs> in the case of an immunity from damages claims arising, arising out of official acts extending to the outer perimeter of his authority, we have never suggested that the president or any other official has an immunity that extends beyond the scope of any action taken in an official capacity. All right, in your own words. Well, he's protected by immunity for things that he does while serving the office, but anything beyond that, he is not immune from. Okay, good. So here's the rule, right? The rule in Clinton v. Jones is that the president does not have temporary immunity during his office from allegations that arose before his office began. Okay? In other words, you don't have to wait till the year 2000 to sue the president for those sorts of actions. Okay? That's the simple rule. The better rule, right? The better rule is why is this the case, right? Why is no temporary immunity? Why is this case differently reasoned than Nixon and Fitzgerald? Crystal, why does the court think that these sorts of lawsuits are okay, but the Nixon and Fitzgerald case was bad? Again, in that case, Nixon had been out of office for almost eight years. There was no distraction. Why is this case different? The court mainly focuses on that it's, there's not going to be a burden placed upon him. There's no burden. Why is there no burden? Well, I think ultimately there was. But the oh, they're big time. He, Nick, Clinton was almost removed from office because of this, right? He involved Lewinsky and stuff, but this this <laughs> genesis, right? This this entire thing almost led to his removal. He wasn't getting removed, but he was impeached in the House. Didn't come close to two thirds in the Senate. Didn't even get half. But this almost ruined his presidency. This entire thing. So the court says, Crystal says, well, there's not much of a risk of distraction and harassment. Is that true? No, it wasn't true. But in hindsight. In hindsight, but... Why did at least, let's give Justice Stevens the benefit of the doubt. Why did Justice Stevens think that this would be a big problem? What, what was Stevens working on? What was his you know, background? I think it was mainly because it happened prior to it. So it's something that already happened and was kind of already dealt with. It was resolved and now the president just has to, I guess, clean up the mess that he already made. Okay. But, 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 Eric, let me ask the question a different way. Why does Justice Stevens think there's not much of a risk of harassment and extortion? Sort of thing? What's, what's going on there? Um, what's the history of people suing the president? Is there, is there a lot of history there? Oh, yeah, just that there's not. So why, why does Stevens think there's not going to be a problem? Uh, I guess just that... It, it wouldn't necessarily open up a floodgate like some other 
like you may think that there there would be. Um, just that if it doesn't happen very often, just because we rule, uh, you know, that the president is not immune this time, mm. doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's going to open the doors to this massive litigation. Yeah. So one of my favorite lines in the article, I mean, the article in the in the, um, in the opinion is this: If the past is any indicator, it seems unlikely that a deluge of such litigation will ever engulf the presidency. Does anyone think <laughs> that this prediction is held up at all? No, 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 it hasn't. There has been a deluge uh, against the president since the moment he stepped into office. Um, so Stevens' first point is there's not likely to be a big uh, you know, increase in litigation. In hindsight, it was probably not right. But his other argument, I think, may have some merit, right? Martin, to what extent is this litigation actually a distraction for the president? Is it? Or does, or does it? Let me ask you, does it have to be a distraction for the president? It doesn't have to be. Why not? He can delegate. No, what do you mean delegate? He, he can hand it off to a special prosec prosecutor and focus on presidency things. <laughs> what, what, what word did you use? Presidency. Presidency, okay. Um, I know those were, but I'll, I'll go for it, right? How about presidential? Good. That's a much better word. Betwixt the two, I prefer presidential. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it's struck out. Yeah, no, you, you got 500. So um, I make up words all the time, it's fine. Um, but I, th I think your point is, is, is well stated, right? With civil cases, the president's not required to go to court, right? Gets, it's not like a criminal case. The president can send a subordinate to go to court for him. Also, the president can settle the case, right? How much would it take to pay off a sexual harassment case? I mean, a million, whatever the number is, is a number, right? Any, well, generally any case can be settled, although sometimes they can't be settled, right? Mahara, why may, when you're suing the president, people may not want to settle, even if there's a reasonable settlement amount to be had. Maybe, maybe, specifically, the president, why may they not be want to have a settlement? If you're, if you're suing the president, what may be, you know, multiple motivations? Well, you want to go Yeah. What are you going to try and do to the president? Yeah. Do everything we can to ruin his reputation. Embarrass him, right? I, th I think she's right. So often when the president's sued, this is not like usual litigation where if you make the right settlement offer, the case goes away. You're trying to extract blood. You're trying to inflict <coughs> damage in the president through the legal process, right? There's a phrase which you may have heard called lawfare. Lawfare. It has a lot of meanings, but it generally means using the law for the sort of um, political purposes. And there's nothing wrong with it. But the courts are available. There's jurisdiction. The parties are, are present. You're, you're bidding, giving pleadings to the court. But make a mistake, right? Let's say that Trump did engage with sexual harassment with this Miss Universe contestant. In a, in a normal world, with any other businessman, he would give her a settlement, and the case would go away confidential. But there's an incentive to inflict political damage on your opponents. It happens all the time. So what Stevens, I think, also didn't quite grasp is the extent to which his litigation was used for exactly that purpose. And Stevens writes, if this case is properly managed, it appears unlikely to us to occupy any substantial amount of petitioner's time. Um, indeed, the impeachment of Clinton took up a lot of time. Basically, government didn't do much for a couple of years. Right? That, that occupied the entire government. But again, none of this could have been known at the outset, right? None of this could have been known at the outset about what burden this creates. So the court up here, right? The, the, and this is unanimous, 9-0, right? The, the court upholds the power of the president to be subject to lawsuits from prior conduct, right? Basically saying he can be sued. But I want to now move on to the questions the court didn't address, which were in the subject of the readings I gave you separate. Right? And there will be two questions. There's some time left to discuss it. The first of these questions is, can the president be indicted with a crime during his office? I don't care about afterwards. Afterwards, he can go whatever he wants. Right? He's not president anymore. But can he be indicted during his office? And the second question is, can the president issue himself a pardon? 
Uh, I gave you I gave you a couple articles written by someone I really respect on this. I mean, these are these are hard questions, and and one of the things I respect about Brian Colt is he wrote about this before it was politically relevant, and he ultimately doesn't come out with a good answer one way or the other. He says these are hard questions. Most most things you read say, of course you can be charged, and of course you can be pardoned. Always take with a grain of salt people um, who answer these tough questions with such certainty. But actually, what was your take on the first question? Can the can the president be Indicted. What are the arguments for and against it? Let's, let's do it that way. That might be a fair way. I don't care if you think he should or shouldn't, but what are the arguments for and against the ability of Well, I, I think that it was talking about, the article was talking about um, that it's pretty uncertain. Um, well, that it, it, sure would just, it would just have to, like a, an attorney would have to... <coughs> what kind of attorney? A prosecutor. At what level? A state? Prosecutor? Yeah. So let's talk about that for a minute, right? Um, Ken Starr, who was the Whitewater prosecutor, he had his jurisdiction under an independent counsel statute. That was the same law upheld in Mark and Wilson. That law expired in 1999 or 2000. So we don't have a truly special counsel anymore, right? Um, you may have read that Robert Mueller has been appointed as a special counsel, but he is not subject to the same sort of protection. Um, he can be fired by the Attorney General uh, with certain restrictions, which aren't really relevant for today. But, Ash, I'll come back to you. What would it take then for the special, for, for the president to be indicted now without a special counsel, without, with a truly independent special counsel? Who would have to sign off on it? The AG. So under the current regime, in order for Mueller to seek an indictment, the Attorney General Sessions would have to sign off on it. And the President sure can fire the AG. And that creates a, a potential other Saturday Night Massacre where if the AG tries to indict his boss, he'll be fired. So I think it's unlikely that there'll be a federal prosecution. But your question, under a second, your question about a state prosecutor, the President can't fire a state Attorney General. The president can't fire the Manhattan attorney general, right? He, he just he can't do it. So what happens then if the state prosecutor tries to bring charges against the president? Hunter. Well, my question was, uh, if Sessions recused himself. It's actually Rosenstein, not Sessions, to be yeah, precise. So would that fall on the deputy? The de well, the deputy is actually the acting attorney general at the moment for purposes of this. But he can be fired also. And it actually gets more complicated because the person to fire the deputy is the attorney general, but the attorney general is recused, so it actually gets really thorny. I don't want to I, I sing away from those weeds for now. But then, so Emily, what happens if a state prosecutor tries to charge the president? What are the arguments that dismiss the indictment? They cite McCulloch versus Maryland. McCulloch, okay, good. What, what, why is McCulloch relevant? Because state officials cannot obstruct any federal, um, basically, Functions of the federal government. I, I know I said that, but McCullough, is that the holding? I mean, is that, is that obviously clear from the case? Does, does McCullough have anything to do with this case? No. No. Yeah, this is one of those cases, you're exactly right. I think that I think that's actually a good answer. It's my personal take on it. But there's not a clear answer anyway whether the Supremacy Clause bars such a thing. Um, there's a general notion that, that the states can't frustrate the federal government, but it's not clear. And what happens if the state trial judge refuses to dismiss the indictment? You can then seek an appeal from the state court of appeals, what they agree. And then the state Supreme Court, what they agree. Then we go back to the US Supreme Court, and they have to decide whether a state prosecution for a state law violation could proceed. Right? Kevin, what about the issue of distraction? Is the issue of distraction diverting the present different in the criminal context from the civil context? Um. I think so. Why? Uh, I think in a criminal trial, you're, you're more involved mm. uh, just because the defendant. Why are you generally more involved in a criminal trial than a civil trial? There's a very good reason. You're, you're right. Because the defendant actually shows up. You have to be present. Trial. Yeah. You have to be present. With a civil trial, there's no requirement for the defendant to be present. With a criminal trial, you got to be there. You got to be there every day. And this can be a trial that takes months. And so while the president should be, you know, defending the free world, he's going to be stuck in court every day. All right, Brittany, what's another reason why you may not want the U.S. president sitting in the 
criminal trial. Well, what if they get sentenced to prison? Oh, what a good point. What if they're, it wasn't what I was thinking, but it's a good one. Oh. What if they're sentenced? Can they continue? Can you be the president by bars? Yeah. I don't think you can. Can you do, what do you think? So would you just suspend it, or would you? How do you suspend the presence? There's a way to do that. Or suspend the sentence, like, oh, serve you jail sentence afterwards. Yeah. Okay, well, let's say, let's say the person, the president's on trial for six months, can't get anything done, because he's in trial all day. You know, wars are waged, and people attack us while the president is in court. He says, Your Honor, I need a brief recess to go check with my commanders about an incoming military strike in North Korea, right? <laughs> You're laughing, but there's a cost being the president in a courtroom and not in a situation room, because you can't, you know, you have to leave your cell phone at the gate, you know, there, there's stuff that has to happen. You hold the trial at the White House, right? Can the president pause the trial every once that how the trial runs? No. Kelly, what do you think? What's another cost to having the president sit on trial for criminal offense? I just think it would look worse to the public. Oh, what do you mean? That's actually what I was actually thinking of, but what do you mean? I think just from public relations, it would look worse. Well, the president broke the law. Why shouldn't he look bad? Right, absolutely. Now, is it just the public here, or who else is going to be watching? the world. Yeah, this is, I think, a, a significant point. Nixon raised this when he fired the special prosecutor. He basically argued that if I'm indicted and charged for a crime, it's going to frustrate my ability to negotiate treaties around the world. Right? Because what country is going to want to do negotiation if the president's on his way out? I'm oh, sorry, someone, yes. Raise your hand, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sometimes I just think out loud. I think you, you have a really good hearing. I do, I'm sorry. My ears popped. Oh, I'm so happy. I can actually hear you. Like, it popped literally this last night. So I have very good hearing. Sorry. I was just... You want to say, repeat it or no? Um, well, during election, I, I'm not sure. I'm not a election, but during elections, um, based on the person that's elected or the, the doubt of who or who may not, it, it affects the stock market. Absolutely. I mean, there are national implications. The president sits on a trial our ability to negotiate treaties, make international trade pacts. There, there are a lot of collateral effects, right? But then China. Go back to our question. Is the president of the law? The president broke the law. He's indicted by a grand jury. Why should he not sit for a trial like anyone else? I think people put the position of president above the law and let the law revolve around what they need the president to do. What did you put for this question uh, when you started? True or false? I put false. Did you change your answer in the middle? Yes. You did. You made it true after. Mm. Why did you change your answer? Um, because just hearing about how much they're willing to jump the hoops. The judges, yeah. that is, right? Yes. Um, to make sure that the president... I mean, there's so many things that the president can do to avoid being actually sentenced and convicted. <coughs> So I think, I mean, I, I appreciate all of your answers are very good. There are a lot of very compelling answers why the president should not be subject to a criminal trial while he's in office. I think everyone agrees after office you can charge him with whatever you want, unless the statute runs. But um, there are good reasons not to. But you run into China, right? What is then the above the law question, right? Is the president above the law? Is he immune from prosecution? We just exempt him flat out. What, you know, you say it makes, makes the president look bad to try him. Let me ask you the flip side. Has a look if we don't try him, right? What message does that send if we don't even try our own leaders for, for crimes? Yeah, you're just letting him get away with Well, at least for now. Mm -hmm. He can come back a couple of years, maybe. Yeah. Let's say the statute of limitation runs. You won't be able to try him. Say you're in year one of the presidency. It's an eight-year presidency, right? Let's say you don't get, you never get to it. By the way, so statute of limitations are flexible things. Um, with something called conspiracy, you can basically make it stretch forever. So that's not usually a problem, but as, as it is, right? Oh, you were next, so let's call on you. No, no, go, it's fine, it's fine. I'll call on you later, it's fine. Um, it's fine. I, I, I'm not blaming everybody. I've had students who deliberately go to the bathroom about to call on them. I, I'm not saying that was fair, but I, I've had that happen. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, I have a question about this, because going back to Clinton and versus Jones, there was not a temporary or civil damages, but it didn't talk about if there was something criminal that happened prior to the presidency. Do you, and we're kind of talking about that now. Do you think there's as strong of an argument that that 
Your question, please. So, there's not a temporary immunity for civil things while a president is in office for things that happened prior to the yes. presidency. But does that apply to criminal? No. Things as and well? the court, as we said, we're not talking about criminal here. Because again, civil damage or whatever, who cares about Paul Jones? It's no big deal. But criminal has a much bigger implication. If you think about it, when there's a criminal trial, who are the parties? Is the defendant and who's on the other side? The people. United States, right? When the president breaks the law, it's not merely a crime against Paul Jones, it's a crime against the United States government. And that's of a much higher gravity, and not, not to diminish Paul Jones's accusation, but this was a case of sexual harassment between two people, right? Significant for them, but it doesn't have nature and implications. The president breaking the law, that is a crime against the republic itself. So even if the crime happened prior to his presidency, he would be after. I think if it's the crime was before, it's a closer call. But if it's a crime during the presidency, I think it's a it's it's a, it's a much harder question. Yeah, Danny. So I understand all the arguments that you made as to the importance of, of maintaining the president's reputation and retaining uh, retaining his status amongst the world as a world leader, et cetera, et cetera. Also, uh, the, the I don't know. What the declaration states that we the people and then talks about created equal, blah, 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 uh, not blah, 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 but you know what I mean, so on and so forth. Doesn't it demonstrate that <coughs> holding one man despite of his position and not holding him accountable for his actions, it would demonstrate that we the people, we're not equal, oh, that our, our rights yeah. are not based on us as humans or men or whatever, but rather on status. So what was the end goal of the Declaration of the Supreme Unjust King? What did we do? One more time, please. What was the end game of the Declaration because we had an unjust king? What, what, did, the, what did the framers do? They... What, what, what they was separate. the result of having a, a despot? They separated. They had a revolution. Yeah. So is that what you're suggesting? I'm not suggesting a revolution. I just suggest that... But that, that's exactly what the coup is, right? Let's take Brittany's question, or Kelly's question. The president gets sentenced. He's in jail. The president can't be president anymore. That's nullifying the effect of an election, isn't it? You could say that the president breaking the law gave his own office up, right? Because uh, he shouldn't have done that. Um, I think my, the response to that is also, it's really easy to charge with a crime. When you have 20 prosecutors going after someone, you can find something. You all commit a, three felonies a day. There's a good book called Three Felonies a Day. You all commit at least three felonies a day. Trust me on this one. So it's not hard to find someone. If you, if you have enough smart prosecutors, you can get the goods on them. Right. But, but I see your point, right? If we don't live up to our own ideals, what's that say about our own commitment to the rule of law? I saw another hand somewhere. Yeah, Brian. Aren't all these uh, privileges that we're talking about codified or authorized by Congress to some extent? Which ones are we talking about? I mean, like, uh, these are all, you know, putting off a... The Supreme Court made that up. Litigation. The Supreme Court made that up. None of that, in fact, that was Stevens's point. Congress has not acted here. If Congress wanted to, they could limit the jurisdiction of the courts to exclude suits against the president. I mean, they, Congress can modify the jurisdiction of the federal courts very easily. Andrew? Um, she filed this in federal court? In Little Rock, yeah. Why did she file it in like, a state court if he was governor when it happened? Well, the question is, could you even sue the president in state court? This is McCulvey, Maryland, at, uh, uh, Emily's point. The court seems to suggest you couldn't bring in state court, but they don't, they don't resolve that, which is why I mentioned the Miss Universe suit against uh, President Trump was brought in New York State Court. I tend to think McCullough provides a rule here, but it's, uh, it's open. It kind of seems like it's not that the president's above the law, he's just a lot higher than the rest of us. So he's not above it, but he's just higher than everyone else. Yeah. So, so like law, Josh, and president somewhere in here? Okay, I'll take that. Anyone else before we move on to the pardon power briefly? All right, let's look at the pardon power. This, there's even less to go on, because if there's any provision of the Constitution that puts the president above the law, it's a pardon power. Because I want you again to think about this. A person was indicted by a grand jury, tried by a jury. A judge approved the conviction and sentenced him. The executive branch prosecuted the appeal. There was a law of Congress that was violated, right? 
Every facet of our government goes into a criminal conviction. You never thought of it that way, but trust me, it is. When you are convicted of a crime, every facet of our republic is involved in that trial. You're appealed up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court itself, I mean, they only take like 75 cases a year, but they consider your case for a few seconds before they deny it. But, but <laughs> they, 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 they do, in fact, um, uh, the board held their long conference yesterday, so we'll get some new grants this week for review. But every facet of government was involved in your case, and, and they all said this conviction stands. When the president issues a pardon, it's saying, yeah, that's nice, you guys, I'll take it from here. Right, hold my beer. I'm going to take over <laughs> this case. That science we found he was guilty, I'm going to wipe out his conviction. That science we sentenced him to jail for life, I'm going to wipe it out. Now, generally the presidents have been circumspect with the pardon power, and that they usually wait till the very end of their administration. Usually it's the last week or last day in office that you hand out all these controversial pardons, right? Just get it off their docket uh, uh, before they leave office. But the question is now, could the president pardon himself? And there are a few things to discuss. First, can you pardon a crime that hasn't been charged yet? The answer is yes. Or at least we think, think the answer is yes. Um, President Ford pardoned Nixon, not just for any crimes he committed, but any crimes to be charged in the future. Right? Because imagine you should pardon for crimes A, B, and C. And some creative prosecutor says, oh, I got crime D, then you get this one. Right? So you can actually have a full pardon for any future offense that could be charged. Basically, it's bulletproof, or at least until someone tries you in state court, right? You can still be tried in state court with a, with a pardon, by the way. Uh, you think of Sheriff Arpaio, he can still be tried in state court, mm -hmm. even though he had a pardon. But even though you can pardon someone prospectively, there's this principle of law that says no man should be a judge in his own cause. This is referenced in Margaret vs. Madison. Um, and it's something very central to our republic, that you shouldn't be able to help yourself out. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily absolute. The president can do lots of things for his own benefit, um, uh, uh, totally apart from the pardon power. Uh, and perhaps one final note is that when the president nullifies a pardon, he's also nullifying the decision of the judiciary. Um, and the, the, the notion of due process of law requires that all aspects of our government get fair process. If the president just wipe that out, what's that say? Um, I'll end on this note, which you'll be happy with is, I don't know. Uh, you're taking Kamala with me in uh, uh, September of 2017. Uh, the next year is maybe a little bit rough and rocky, uh, but I hope that the, the lessons that I try to impart here for you uh, provide some guidance. So what do we know for sure, right? We know from U.S. v. Nixon, the president's subject to subpoenas. So he has to, be able to, he has to turn over records. What do we know from Nixon v. Fitzgerald? The president can't be sued for his official acts during his office. And what do we know from Clinton versus Jones? We know that the president can be sued for prior acts in federal court. What don't we know? Can the president be prosecuted in the federal court for a crime? We don't know if the president can be prosecuted in a state court for a crime. We don't know if the president can be sued in a state court for a civil offense. Um, I don't pretend there's an easy answer here. Uh, the courts will likely have to resolve these at some point uh, sooner rather than Anything else? Okay. Thank you all so much. See you on Thursday.